the the Drake was funny. The Drake was for fun. That was, um, uh, I mean, it was just time. It was timely. It was very timely. And uh, I mean, the best part about it was the backlash, the, it, the love and the hate that it got online, because it was it was nothing more than just. Um, seeing something fucking hilarious and making a right. meme out of it yeah. that's like you see a video you see a little clip on something and somebody takes that shit makes it into a meme mm -hmm. and it goes viral right and it's like everybody has something to say about it or it's hilarious or whatever but that's all it was and, and the thing was is that we were so proud of our city at the time yeah. that like um you know uh you know everybody was doing kawaii's and, and my buddy wanted me to actually do a lowry yeah. right and i wanted to and i had i know i had a I had a, a real estate agent company, that, like a real estate company that wanted me to do a huge Lowry on the side with a trophy. I yeah. wanted to do it so bad. Mm -hmm. But um, when Drake came out with that Del Curry jersey, I like, I, I literally was rolling. Like yeah. that was one of the funniest things I think I've ever seen in sports. Like easily the, easily the best troll I've ever seen. And um, it was so, it was so well-timed that I was like, oh, if we're gonna paint anything, we're doing that. Like that's hilarious. So it wasn't just to, uh, you know, to be proud of our Raptors and be proud of our city and to put Drake on the wall to get views and likes. That shit was just hilarious. And I was like, and my buddy, and my buddy really trusts me. And he, he just was like, this is your wall, man. He goes, you want to do it? He goes, I trust you. Yeah. You trust me, right? So he was just like, go for it. Like, we'll see what it is. And uh, it took me like three days to paint. I did it on, like when we were like, uh, we were up two. I think we were two and one. Yeah. And then, uh, so we were up and I was like, okay, I'm doing this now. It took me three nights. I had it ready for game five where we thought we were going to win. Yeah. And then, um, and I was like, we watched it at the studio. We watched it at my buddy's tattoo studio, Bamboo. And um, uh, we watched it there and they lost. And so we watched the game, we watched the game six again. And I was like, yo, if they win, I'm painting, you know, uh, if you're reading this, the Raptors made history, like right away, as soon as they win. And that's exactly what happened. So I had the mural done and then, uh, wrote it, you know, 10 minutes after we won, people were driving by honking and everything. And in the morning it got picked up. Mm -hmm. So as I was painting it, I realized I think it's the only mural of Drake in the entire city, which is crazy because he right. has the biggest, biggest artist in the world. You know yeah, what I mean? But yeah. they always say, you know, um, the most hate comes from where you start. Right. Right. So um, it is what it is, but I thought it was hilarious. And it was just a, it was a, an ode to that, but it definitely caught fire because, you know, People were like, oh, he doesn't play for the Raptors. And, yeah. you know, they didn't like you that he was associating himself. But at the end of the day, like, um, the star power that Drake's brought to the city is it's undeniable, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, uh, he literally brought the entire eyes of the world and the media on us. I mean, so many artists, great artists before him tried to do it. They just couldn't. Right. And he just broke down yep. barriers that, like, allowed our city to be viewed in the media. Um, from him bringing in the star power to like us having like, you know, our NBA all-star game, these big events that really focus the world's attention on, on our on our city. And uh, I mean, we're a very, very small city compared to some of the biggest cities in the world that are like, you know, New York, LA, Miami, and, and like, um, uh, you know, the UK, like in, in, in London and all these things <clears throat> by demographic. We have a very small population, a very small land mass size, you know what I mean? Yep. 40, 50 square blocks is like our downtown core. That's the size of Central Park. Yeah. Right? So it's like, um, there's a lot of opportunity for people who are doing something here to be picked up by the rest of the world with the amount of media attention that we have. So if people are on their shit and they're doing things that are authentic and they're doing things that are real, yeah. I mean, you're gonna get noticed. It's a matter of time, but it's just like, how real are you gonna be, right? right? Are you just pandering to the people who like, oh, make some money, mm -hmm. or whatever I gotta do. Right? Or like you actually have something to say and you wanna you wanna you know you want people to say that guy's from Toronto. Yeah. Right? Like exactly. we didn't go there to find him, that's where he's from. Right. You know what I mean? And like you're representing where you're from and the people around you and the situations that brought you up and, and the things that you've learned in your life by living here. I, I love this city. Like anything you're into, anything you wanna do with your life, you can do here. Mm-hmm. Hundred percent. There's people who will will follow you into it, right? Because like it's a very, very eclectic city. It's very open, very honest. Um, but I really feel, especially in the art scene, there's a lot of, uh, um, it's just untapped. You know what I mean? There's there's nobody who's looking at us with any value. Yeah. You know what I mean? They know we're here and they know this place is great, yeah. but what value do we have, right? 
I know people who would much rather go to New York and buy art than mm -hmm. to come here and buy art. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of artists here that can't sell their work here. They right. have to go to the US, or they have to go to the European markets because they just, they're not valuable, right? They're only valuable when people go there to see them. Yeah. Who the hell is coming here? Right. Right. I think it's like you, what you were saying earlier in an earlier conversation behind that, um, we need to change, change this dynamic, right? Um, because it seems that, yeah, some people in our own towns don't support us, right? We need to change that dynamic to 100 percent And we have world-class artists here, I'm, literally. And I know that because they exhibit all over the world, Yeah. right? I know people that literally, they have, they have their work in New York, Miami, LA, you know what I mean? And they can go there and sell, no problem, mm -hmm. right? But why won't people come to here to get it? Or why don't the investors that are here look here, right? Some of the biggest murals in our city, the most, you know, the, the, the most uh, epic looking murals here, they weren't done by any Toronto artists. They were done by Peruvian artists or Brazilian artists, right? right? Because they're phenomenal. Yep. But the thing is, is that, and I have nothing knocking that. I mean, Street Art Toronto has a one-to-one -one program in the city where basically like, if let's say an artist uh, wants to come from Germany, mm -hmm. right? And they want to do, uh, they want to do a mural here, then we have a deal with them, with their municipality, that like we also get to send an artist there. Right. So we'll do a piece there, which is yep. phenomenal. It's a great, it's a great concept because it promotes work all over the place. Right. But what it doesn't do is, it's 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 not giving, and I can't say that it's not giving the opportunities to Toronto artists, or they're not taking them. Yeah. Right. Because at the end of the day, if you produce a product that is subpar, you're gonna lose doesn't matter what you what you value or who you are or where you come from there's no bias on you your bias is a, is a bias within yourself right so it's like if you want to succeed over other people then you've got to be able to prove why right right so nothing is nothing is gained that's not taken do you know what I mean you have to be able to accept opportunities and go after them and that's why nobody should ever complain for losing losing uh, a job or losing it's like you lost it yeah. You know what I mean? That's on you. Or you didn't gain it, <coughs> yeah. right? And um, if you can give somebody something that they can't get anywhere else, they'll always come back to you, right? So what are we not giving the city of Toronto that they can find everywhere else? Do you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. And to artists, that's the main focus. It's like, I know big artists here and people who are phenomenally good at what they do, but why haven't they caught the attention of the world, right? Why are they being passed over for other things that are maybe kitschy or, or, you know, aesthetically beautiful at the same time, but like maybe, maybe they're just not creating the vibe or they're not, they're just going with the flow. Yep. They're not creating anything dynamic. They're not creating right. anything that's different. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're not telling people why they should give a shit, mm -hmm. right? They're just expecting them to. Right. And like nobody gives handouts. Nobody, nobody's waiting, waiting in behind door number two with your check, right? You got to go out there and find it. For people who think, you know, like I, I come from a, a, a very entrepreneurial background, right? With my family. And like sales 101 is the more doors you knock, the higher your percentage of, you know, making a deal is. Right. But if you don't go out in there and knock doors, nobody's bringing you money. Nobody's bringing you a deal. Nobody's bringing you opportunities. You have to go find it. Right. Right. And um, it's like Babe, Babe Ruth used to say, he used to say he loves striking out. Right? And the reason he loves striking out because he goes, because I know that I'm just closer to hitting a home run. Right? It's only a matter of time. Mm -hmm. So if you get good at what you do and you constantly compete with yourself instead of the people around you, um, and you just get better and better and better, regardless of people ever validate you, you yeah. validate yourself. Yes. You know what I mean? And that's 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 what's the most important. You know, not oh my bank account's not very big, so I don't value myself properly. Yeah. Right? It's like it's like, no, I value myself because I fucking was able to make a sculpture for a company and I've never made one before. Mm -hmm. That's crazy to me, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, getting 90% uh, of the work that I get, I have zero prerequisite for. People just hire me because I, 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 I don't say no. Can you do this? Yeah, I'll figure it out, yep. right? Because I've taught myself that if I figure out one thing, I can figure out this. And I figure out that. You do that enough times, you realize there's no ceiling on what you can learn. Yeah. You just have to have the drive and the passion to want to do it. Yeah. Right? And be honest with yourself. Those are things that you might not be able to do. Facts. Right? Because like if somebody comes to me and they're like, I want you to design me a building, right? I don't fucking know all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Could I learn it? Probably. Would it be advantageous to the client to wait for me to learn it? No. Right? So it's about being honest 
with yourself and being honest with other people about what your capabilities are right. and never thinking that there is a cap on what you can learn. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's why I think most people fail. They, they just, they decide that it's too hard. Leave it up to somebody that, that does that talent with talent, right? Mm -hmm. When you start forgetting about everybody else and start realizing that even if they didn't matter, like you're not competing with anybody but yourself. Nobody gives a shit. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares if you succeed, mm -hmm. right? You need to care that you succeed because you only have one life. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like, um, you got to be able to prove to people why you're, you're worthy of their attention, right? And really the fucked up thing is, is the only way to really do that is to not care about their attention. Right. Right? Yeah, exactly. Not when, you, focus. when you don't care, that's when they come to you. Yeah. It's like, just like when you, people are looking for romance or they're looking for a partner, right? They like, they instantly are like looking for love, never find it. Or you find the wrong thing. So true. Right? So when you true. don't look, people gravitate towards that. Why do they gravitate towards that? Because they see that you on, you're on your shit. Yeah. You're in your natural element and you, you look, um, you look uh, like, um, what's the word? Um, you're appealing. Very you're appealing. appealing. You're super appealing, yeah. right? Yeah. When you're on your shit, and people fall in line with what you're doing. They want right. to be around you. Yep. You don't have to go out and find them and, and cater to them and uh, you know go see where they're at. Nah, they come to you, yes. right? Yes. And if it works with you, it works with you. If it doesn't, you, you're not even worried about it. Keep it moving. Right? And, and that's the most genuine kind of relationship that you want with anybody. And it's simply because you don't put weight on other people's thoughts about it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's why the best people blow up. It's because they were just busy on their shit. They were just worried about their own shit. I'd say 98% of multi multi millionaires and super successful people were not focused on the money yeah. you know what i mean they were focused on getting really good at what they did mm -hmm. and that's all they happened and and they got so good that people just wanted a piece of that and that's where the money came in yep. you know what i mean so if you focus on being good at what you do and loving what you do that shit will come yeah. right and that that was the, that that's the biggest thing i think people in the city need to realize it's like just focus on what you want to say and Make it as big as you possibly can. You do it for yourself. Don't do it for, you know, to gain followers or attention or money or backing or any of that stuff. Just do it to see if you can do it. Yeah. You wanna you wanna blow up? You wanna you wanna be recognized? You want people to hear what you have to say, right? Then don't care what they have. Don't care if they, they, they get it or not. Just say what you have to say. You know what I mean? And that's 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 how I feel about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that's hopefully what I'll be able to do is I just I have uh, stuff that I want to put out and it's not necessarily you know this is what you have to listen to and this, sometimes it's just fun mm -hmm. check this out mm -hmm. you know what I mean did you ever think about it this way yeah I literally I don't specialize in any of the art that I do as like a style it's not something where you're gonna look at it and be like oh some artists do that some artists, maybe maybe some people can mm -hmm. but like I can right yeah. um, but the thing is is that what I want to add into all of my pieces at least is perspective Right, a change in perspective and a change in like um, how people view things. Sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes like uh, literally, right? But sometimes just maybe it's a different way of thinking, yeah. right? Maybe it's not just visually a different actual perspective. It's it's like a way of thinking. Oh, okay, I, I get that. Maybe I didn't get that. Maybe it's ironic. Maybe it's it's in your face, different perspective, right? Those are the kind of things that I, I enjoy doing because it, it just uses different parts of my brain to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you I'll give you one example. So um, I was hired by uh, Toronto Premier Outlets. A buddy of mine was the general manager and he told me that they were doing a, a bid for a bunch of artists to give in a proposal for uh, Canada 150, mm -hmm. right? Where we you know present like a sculpture idea or whatever, and uh, you know they'll fund it and it, it has to be ready for Canada Day. It was I think about three months out mm -hmm. and. Um, so I was like, yeah, sure, 100%. Like, I, again, I always had this epitome. Uh, I always felt like, you know, as an artist, one of the biggest things you can do is do like those sculptures in front of like condos and stuff like that. Like, it's, it's such an, a monumental price tag on those things, and it's such a monumental like accomplishment to have this huge production of a metal thing or whatever it is. And like, I figured that like, only the biggest architects and the biggest people in the world got those kind of commissions. Yeah. And. Um, uh, so it just, it was always that frame in my mind. I mean, it's not like I was ever going to do anything like that or an architect or anything like that. It was just like, I, I just had that vision. 
of like these big things, right? And um, I, my buddy hit me up with the, with the, you know, the artist call for this proposal. I had a bunch of different ideas. I was gonna make like a map of Canada with like water pipes going in it, spraying out, just really cool visual stuff. Nothing that really meant anything, but just like, mm -hmm. I wanted to make something that was just dynamically different, and cool, and like, played off maybe different materials and different uses of water and all this kind of stuff. And then um, I, I created these big perspectives, like these two big proposals. And um, uh, you know, they were, I, he gave me the he gave me the, the assignment, and two days later I had to finish. Like I'm like direct because I wanted to get them in as soon as humanly possible, so that they were like, oh okay, like just in case they changed it up or they wanted to see more mm -hmm. at time, right? Yeah. So I finished them right away. I was super excited, and mind you, I've never made a sculpture this big. Right? I, I made one for a friend of mine, Laura Zombie. It was the first thing I ever had in an art show. Mm -hmm. And it was like a life-size unicorn. Okay. Right? All the paper mache and Humber newspaper and all kinds of stuff. But that was the first sculpture I'd ever made either. Right? Yeah. And it was commissioned. So it was cool you just kind of jump in. You know what I mean? Figure it out on the way as long as you know that you're not going to give up. Yeah. So um, with this sculpture, I had an idea of doing a big... Uh, Oh, so, so I sent these two proposals just before I sent them off. I had this really cool idea, um, very, very simplistic, but very meaningful. And I sketched it on a little piece of paper and I just scanned it or I took a photo of it and I sent that along a little tiny quick write up, took me like five minutes, right? Whatever. No presentation involved whatsoever in it. And I sent that off. And I got a call back from them the next day and they were like, these proposals are cool. They're like, but what is this sketch? Yeah. Right, like this is different. Like, what is this? Can you make this? And it was basically a giant concrete hugging maple leaf, mm -hmm. right? So it's just a maple leaf made of metal and steel, it's fucking seven feet tall, and it's just curled in, so it's hugging, right? Right, and it's got a heart of gold, and it just completely embodied what Canada is to me, right? And it, it's called the one embrace, yeah. So they were like, We want you 100% to make this, so I won the bid for it. And I had a month to make it, and I, I made it, delivered it installed it and the day after Canada Day or sorry the day of Canada Day uh, I took my ex-girlfriend at the time right and like brought her there with her mom and like we went to go check it out and there was a photographer they, they brought there to like stand in front of it and there was a line of people that were taking photos with this thing mm -hmm. and the whole premise behind it was that like uh, no matter who you are no matter where you come from this country is ready to embrace you Right? right? Yeah. We will embrace you. We will show you the love and we will, you know what I mean? Regardless of who you are, what you what, what you are, no matter what. And um, all of that work and all of that, you know, it was a difficult situation to say the least. I made zero money on it. And it actually cost me, um, uh, like it was, it just, I, I, I'm not gonna say that they, they failed in, in, in like our business, mm -hmm. um, but I, I overdid it and like it took a long time to get done. Right. So, I mean, I just wanted it to be as best as I could because it was the first thing I'd ever done like that. So I wanted to make sure it was to the nines. Yep. And I killed myself working on it. Uh, it got approved super late. Um, out of the three months, it took five weeks for, for it to go through the CEOs, right? So like, I didn't, even, I didn't even know if I was gonna do this thing. I like, I basically blocked out like three months worth of my time right. um, for a project I didn't even know was happening. And like, I already don't make a lot of money. I was the chef, right? So um, I waited, I waited, and I told them, I was like, like, I gotta find out about this, man. Like, I it came down to where I had five weeks left. Like, it was closing in on a month, and I hadn't even got approval to do it yet. Wow. And I was like, this thing's gonna take me time. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's f f serious. Mm -hmm. So um, just, just after five weeks, I think I had like just shy of five weeks, my buddy calls me in the office and he goes, he goes look, they approved it. They want it done. Uh, the only specifications are that it has to be separated and like a few like you know um, like physical restrictions, or whatever. Um, I had to get like my insurance for it and all this stuff. And uh, he sits me down. And he goes, "Look." He goes, "They want it." He goes, "This is the contract, right?" He goes, "But I tell you this." He goes, "If you don't feel like you can complete this, do not sign this." He goes, "Because they will own you. Yeah. They will own you, yeah. right?" And this was the first big like corporation I'd worked with. And um, I mean, I had already thought it would have been a lot to do in three months, especially never having done something like this before. Mm -hmm. 
um, and there was absolutely zero time for me to waste. And regardless of um, whether I was gonna finish it or not, I had no other, I had no doubts, right? Like I just was like, I'm doing it, that's it. I'm gonna figure out how to get it done. And there were a lot of things in the process that really held me back um, that were, that I like, outsourced. Yeah, so I, I, I took this project on, not knowing if I would finish it or not, but just believing that I would. Yeah. And there were a bunch of setbacks that I had uh, in, in the actual outsourcing of getting certain parts fabricated for it that I need like metal rolled and all this stuff. But I took it on and I wouldn't let myself, like, I literally I slept at my buddy's dive shop. Um, like he gave me a shop to use uh, and like, I like slept there. Like the whole month I was only at home, like, I don't know, maybe three days of the week. Wow. You know what I mean? Like going home to sleep. Like it was yeah. crazy for the whole month. So, but I got it done. I got it done the day before they needed it. We installed it, brought it there. And every bit of it was worth it to see people take photos with this thing because it's, it, I mean, Toronto Premium Outlets gets, I think they said it's like 80,000 people over the course of their, that weekend. Wow. Like to come in there that are all immigrants. They're yeah. all people who just want to come to the mall, they want to shop at the outlet mall and all this stuff. Yeah. And like, it was just unbelievable to see all these people that took this photo with this hugging maple leaf and it was worth every bit of it. And I mean, like I said, it wasn't, it definitely wasn't about the money. Mm -hmm. But it, that was one of those things which is so satisfying that like, I was able to make something I never thought was possible. I never thought I would have ever made. Um, I didn't know if I would ever finish. And once it fin once I finished it, it was like one of the greatest feelings I've ever had. And um, I literally chase that kind of a feeling constantly. Yeah. You know? I like the idea. It kind of reminds me of like, you don't always know or you're not always able to see the road ahead of you. But if you believe and you know, you, you work hard, you have perseverance, yeah. you're really able to kind of complete anything. Yeah. And I've never really been one to be like, oh, I have a five year plan, a 10 year plan and all that stuff. Like I don't believe in that because I believe that like people are fundamentally different over time. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Right. Ask, ask somebody who's 50. If where they, when they were 30 years old, they knew where they, they would be sitting. Mm -hmm. I dare you to find one. Like I, right. I can't imagine somebody 20 years worth of knowledge and just negating that. But what I do feel like strongly about is that people need to have a vision of, of a path they want to go down, mm -hmm. right? And just be fluid. Yeah. Take all the opportunities that come to you and figure out whether they're good or they're bad. Psychoanalyze them in within yourself. You know, be introspective. Figure out whether you know, they matter to you or they don't matter to you or what the possible outcomes are going to be. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's, there's a thing about taking risk and there's a thing about taking educated risks, yeah. right? Taking, taking risks without any educated risk is, is just stupidity, yeah. right? And that's always going to breed a poor outcome. Uh, maybe once in a while you'll hit, you know what I mean? A luck, something that like a good roll of the dice, but like more often than not, you want to judge your, judge things you go forward with your life based on you know what you can like knowledgeably think is, is, a, is, a, is a smart move yeah right even though it still might be risky mm -hmm. and nobody gets anywhere without any risk yeah. right so you have to have that balancing act of it and um, I've just always felt that like that's the only way to go forward just like just like having a path right and undefined path Mm -hmm. I know I want to do art. What does that mean to me? I don't know, but I'm gonna figure it out as I go along. You know right. what I mean? I'm gonna let these opportunities come, not like, oh, I need to be structured. I need this is what I need to learn. This is what I need to learn. No, how about like when people come to you and go, hey, do you wanna you wanna make a? I have a spot in my wall in my restaurant, and I want something cool that involves metal. Can you do something like that? Sure. You know what I mean? Like, have you ever done anything like? That? No. But I'll figure it out because I right. think it's fun. It seems interesting to me, and I can always use use the skills. Right. right? Um, and that was the thing, like, I, I was, I grew up in a shop. My dad is a, a master technician, right? So, you know, triple engineer, like, yeah. always with the math side, you know, these Guyanese, so you grew up, like, you know, uh, math's big, everything, right? Okay. And um, I grew up just farting around a shop, like, you know, building this, making that, and cutting this and cutting that. So, I mean, I grew up in a fabrication shop, always making stuff with my hands, but like, never focused, never like, oh, I have these hard skills, I can weld, I can do all this stuff. I yeah. understood you know, very varying degrees of it, but uh, never did it professionally. So when I left the kitchen about three years ago, three years ago, uh, I ended up working for um, this fabricator and no reason to take me on whatsoever. I had zero prerequisites for this, or zero uh, education in it. Um, my buddy Adam Fullerton, uh, but like I've been following his work on Instagram for so long. 
And I thought, like, literally, this guy's one of the best custom fabricators in the city. And I told him, I was like, yo, do you ever need extra hands? Like, whatever it is, like, uh, I, I, I want to do, like, I want to work with you because I want it's something I want to learn. Uh, I knew it was something I wanted to add to my repertoire, and I knew that if anybody could teach me, it was this guy. And I think he saw the willingness in me to learn, and he needed the extra hands at the time. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be permanent. It was just like he was busy, and he could use the help. Um, and somebody who's not going to fuck up too much is like going to progressively get better over time and not completely keep making mistakes. You know what I mean? And just like it's just like cooking. When I, when I you know, started in the restaurants, the same thing. It's like. Um, you want to make all the mistakes at least once, but never twice. Yeah. You know what I mean? You need to be able to learn from your mistakes. You need to be able to take them forward. I tell that every job I've ever had, I will make all the mistakes. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them. If there's a mistake you made, I will make it. Yeah. But I will never make that mistake twice. Right. right? And that's, that's the way that I go about looking at the things I do for myself now. Right? It's like, um, I didn't start doing this with a lot of money or any money to be to be frank right like so when a client would come to me this is the project we have this is what we need to get done you have so long to do it it's like i have one shot to get this done yeah. because in no time will i ever have the resources or the time to be able to redo it so you start double calculating your steps you start overlooking uh, you start looking at every possible angle of every possible outcome and trying to make no mistakes yeah. right you're gonna make mistakes mm -hmm. But the more zoomed in you are on focus on what you have to do, the better it's gonna come out and the less times you're gonna fail while you're doing it, you know what I mean? So that was always my, my biggest thing. And um, that's why I wanted to work for this guy. It's just He just took me on and realized like, you know, you know maybe I was gonna learn. I, I couldn't tell you why he took me on, but I'm glad that he did. You know what, I really like that because I think I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, it could be, you know, that you're a graffiti artist or it could be that you're starting a new business or fashion line. Like, I think that... Sorry, I was going to say something I told you. Just people, no, no, but just people are like, um, when it comes, so I was saying basically, I'm good at this too. When it comes to uh, only having one chance to do something, mm -hmm. right? Or like um, just taking it on, whether, you, you know what I mean? Just having the willingness to do it. And when you zoom in on all the stuff that like you're when, uh, you're doing, you mitigate the amount of damage that you cause. You know what I mean? And like literally, I've only had one chance to do something, or else I'm gonna owe this person. Now I've wasted my time. Now I've wasted their money. Now I've wasted right. my money. And now I probably can't even put it on my portfolio. And they're probably not gonna give me a good reference. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you look at all these factors, it. it it takes so much to focus on these. It takes so little to focus on these things properly and to try and think of every possible uh, problem. And that's when you realize the passion that you have for something. Right. Right? You don't get there without the with, without really being zoomed in. I have so many friends that, oh, you, you know, you smoke weed when you paint or this and that. And like, I smoke weed since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. Right? But like, at the same time, I don't do anything when I do my art. Right. And I never have because I, I, I literally, like I focus in on it and there's this, there's this idea of aesthetic quality, right? Or aesthetic experience, right? So what aesthetic experience is, is, is being fully alive in the moment of doing something, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, the opposite to that is anesth anesthetizing somebody, right? So that's what a lot of people realize when, you know, when you take Ritalin, you take, uh, you, know, uh, you know, drugs, anything, you're kind of deadening yourself to the reality of life. Right? That's cool. I mean, I teach their own, everybody does it. Yeah. I do it too. But at the same time, it's like when you want to be fully present and fully alive, when you're listening to a song, when you're watching a play, when you're actually actively doing something that's using your mind, right? And you can be fully inside of yourself at that moment and enjoying your life doing whatever you're doing. That's how I feel when I create my, my art, right? When everything else fades away and I'm only focused on a single task. And um, never do I ever want to like, not be able to focus in that moment. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, I really feel that like, I, I don't perform nearly the same, right? When I when I do anything, when I, when I drink, I mean, it, it's cool. Like I have no problem with that. Like I do it all the time. But when I'm focused, yeah. like I'm, I, I'm like 150% focused mm -hmm. on what I'm doing. And uh, that's one thing I've always, I, I've always realized is, is, is like, 
just the passion. That's when you realize that you have passion for something. Mm -hmm. When, whether you are good at it or not, right. whether you know a lot about it or not, right. when you're just focused on learning something, when you're passionate about or interested in what it is, that's when you know that like, you love the thing that you're doing. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when all the bullshit that comes with it doesn't matter anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, what I was gonna say before was just like, your message is important for entrepreneurs, I think, because uh, sometimes I think people, like you don't always have every single skill and you're not like a perfectionist with everything, right? And sometimes that can deter people from doing things, right? Like you said, well, I'm not good enough at this or I'm not good enough at that. And I think it's important, you know, especially in what I'm hearing from you is to, to go with that and to really just like focus in and really take the opportunity to learn more, learn from what other people have done, right? And that's the thing, is like a lot of people really feel like, I mean, and don't get me wrong, teamwork is great, it's important, it's fundamentally important on how to work with other people, because your work is going to touch other people and they're gonna to wanna to work with you and you're gonna need their help. But relying on people yeah. for too much is the wrong move, because, and that's one one of the things I loved about one of the interviews that Nipsey had, right? And he, he talked about how like, if an engineer, if he needed an engineer to do something, he didn't wait for them to do it. He learned how to do it exactly. so that he could get people to do what he wanted them to do, the way he wanted them to do it. And if they they weren't confident, we can't do that. We can't do that. Move out the way. Exactly. I'll do it. Yeah. Right. And that's how I looked at everything. I've never hired another person on. I, I literally, I wish I could. Um, I really feel like either my clients are going to suffer or I don't have time to bring people up to speed, or it's gonna take me twice as long to tell people what I want them to do when I can just do it myself, yes. right? The problem with that is that like, you limit yourself on the scope mm -hmm. of what you're able to do. You might not be able to mass produce yourself, right? right? But I'm okay with that. I don't need to mass produce myself. I like what, I, what I'm able to bring to the table and, and you know, I'm all about increasing my value, yeah. right? So not make a million things for a hundred dollars, but make a hundred things for a million dollars. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that's that's the way that I look at it. I want to increase the value and the worth of what I have and not necessarily monetarily, but like in quality and in time and in um, uh, value to the people that I'm doing work for or that are seeing my work. When yeah. I finally have my first solo show, hopefully later this year once I've finished my studio. Um, like I just want to, I want people to get the value out of what I'm doing and it doesn't have to be for the masses. It doesn't have to, it can be for the few that get it. Mm -hmm. The few that feel the same way I do, right? right, right. And, and, and that's what I really care about. But at the same time, like, that's why I've always taught myself everything or as much as I can, mm -hmm. you know? Taught myself uh, marketing, advertising, and understanding, you know, client relations and understanding, you know, uh, how to deal with other companies and how to present myself professionally mm -hmm. and how to deal with people who um, you know what I mean? Just like everything, just every aspect of what I do so that I'm not just the artist that's sitting there making the art, but I'm the artist that's selling the art and I'm the artist that's promoting the art and I'm the artist that's explaining the art and the artist that's going out and doing like everything. You have to be all encompassing at some points, right? Because mm -hmm. if you rely too much on other people, then you can start pointing the finger at why things didn't work out, right? right? And I want to be completely responsible for all of that stuff. Not only that, but the more you learn about every aspect of what you do, is the easier it becomes for you to delegate what you need done. Mm -hmm. Because then you realize that you have the background knowledge. So if they can't do it, this is how I want you to do it. And this is why, right? Not just leaving it up to people to help you and hope they do a good job, right? right? The more you learn about the thing that you want to do, the better understanding you'll have for the people who eventually work for you, mm -hmm. if you want them to do that, right? right? which can take the load off your shoulders. It can allow you to do more things. I like perfect example. I wear so many hats. I have seven years worth of content. I have never made a YouTube page. I have my, my domains. I have all my stuff. I've never made it. I just simply don't have the time because I'm constantly creating new work. Yeah. So should I hire somebody to do that? Probably. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm sure I will eventually when I, you know, when I've gotten, um, you know, more successful and I can afford it and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, um, I just, but I'll also have to explain people exactly how I want it. Because yeah. I've thought about it for so long, exactly how I want it. Exactly. Right? And you'll have to release some of that control so people can add their, their style to it and do the way they want to do it and really help you out. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's something you have to be versed in. You have to know how to do all these things. 
but um, it, it's a balancing act. You also have to release some things to people so that you can grow and yeah. you can expand the way you want to, mm -hmm. right? So those are the things I'm battling with now, and I, you know, I don't assume you know everything, but I'm learning as I go, and um, um, it's it's all a it's all a um, you know, I really feel like as long as I've been doing this, I haven't even started yet. Yeah. You know, and I really, really feel that way. And I'm, I'm just enjoying everything that I'm doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, one thing I wanted to ask is, you know, like for people who, you know, were just starting out and doing graffiti art, like what are some tips you can give to them? Obviously during this interview, you've given a lot of tips, but if you could give three starter tips what would what would the most important things be to know to a graffiti writer yeah um again like like i said i'm not the best person to ask about the graffiti thing mm -hmm. um simply because i didn't do it first mm -hmm. right i didn't put in the work so i don't want people looking at this and going oh what are you going to tell them you're not a you're not a real writer this and that um but what i did learn like i have been learning about graffiti my whole mm -hmm. life you know what i mean whether i did it or not I, I learned the politics and I think um, that was that would be my tip for people is learn your city's politics mm. talk to other writers one of the biggest things about this city and that a problem a big problem with it is that like and I've talked to writers about it I've talked to Street Art Toronto about it I've heard them talk on panels about it is there is no bridging of the divide of old writers and new writers there's no like a place where they all meet up anymore there's not a, there's, there aren't public walls where like if you go to like Venice Beach they have burner walls yeah. burner walls are places that are, are legal walls that they can paint and people paint over each other's shit does it start fights for sure it starts fights yeah. but now you have a place where old writers can meet new writers and people who want to get into it can watch can do all this stuff you have this this collective space where everybody can convene and like Regardless of if they talk to you or not, you still know who they are. Yeah. You know what they're doing. You, you're able to respect writers. There's a lot of OG writers in the city that are getting disrespected. They're having their murals that have been up for 15, 20 years disrespected by kids who know jack shit about the graffiti scene in the city. Why they come in, they do their little tag, means nothing. They're not running with the crew. They don't know anybody. And if any of those graffiti writers saw them, they flatline them. You know what I mean? They knock them out. Yeah. And, it's, and it's straight up because those kids have not learned the politics. But can you blame people for not having a venue in which to meet other writers? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We're all just running blindly through the city. You guys happen to run into me. Yeah. How do you find a graffiti writer you don't know? Yeah. It's illegal. Mm -hmm. Do they post it online? No. They might. You might not ever find out who they are though. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's like there's no, um, there's no real spot. The other tip I would give is learning your politics is finding out how to learn your politics, which is going to the the, the places that sell cans, mm -hmm. that sell paint, that mm -hmm. sell, you know, those are the hubs. Those are the places where all graffiti writers go. It's the right. guaranteed spot you know they're going to be. Um, are they going to instantly talk to you? No. But if you go around there long enough, like I did since I was a little kid, eventually you learn who's who, whose work is whose. Could I go around and point a lot of the artwork out in the city of, and know who it is? Yeah, but because I've been I've been patient in learning that, did I know it right away? Hell no. Yeah. I can point at an OG writer's piece and people be like, you don't even know who that is? Yeah. You don't know nobody, right? And it's like, nah, I don't. But if you have a willingness to learn, you'll gain that information over time. And the more you talk to people, and the more you're open about talking to people, um, you know, you get more bees with with. Uh, with honey than you right. do with salt, right? right? Like it's like you want you're being sweet to people and you're being nice and you're being open and you're and you're willing to draw with them and you're willing to like um, just open yourself up to learning. Yep. You're gonna learn ten times more than just going out and doing your own thing and, and fucking over people's artwork and, and you know what I mean? Like just right. tagging shit up. Like nobody likes that guy. Yeah. Graffiti yeah. writers don't like that guy. Mm -hmm. Right? People who've been putting in work and doing all that stuff, they don't like that guy.